This is Kaleidoscope. I'm Caitlin Shore, and today I'm here with Dr. Alicia Levy, a scientist by training who also has deep experience in biotech, starting new companies, and as a venture capitalist. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I'd love to start off hearing about what you do. Yeah, um, so I actually recently uh, just sold the company that I was working at for the last four years. So, so um, I was at a company called Pioneer Immunotherapeutics. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were developing uh, immuno-oncology therapies for cancer, um, and we actually just sold the company to another company called Ikenna about four weeks ago. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so what, do you what do you find most fulfilling about your job? I think what I find most fulfilling is when a new scientific finding can crystallize into a new drug uh, candidate or program or maybe a new platform for a new company. I think that is, is a thrill and it's also just incredibly fulfilling and it's like, this is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, when all of those stars align, you know, that's what makes me wanna keep going. You started off as a regular old scientist <laughs> um, and, and, and have ended up in a, in a very different yeah. place, like not a uh, conventional, yeah trajectory for a science PhD, right? So I'd love to hear about those early years of science training and your experience of community at that time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did my PhD at Stanford University. Heard uh, of it. Yeah, <laughs> in Matt Bojo's lab. Um, and I actually chose the lab uh, because I thought it was going to be a great training ground for actually developing technologies that could potentially be applied to actually treating human disease or mm -hmm. diagnosing mm -hmm. human disease. And what I was doing was developing very specific activity-based probes for the cast bases. And I was having, um, I was doing this work where I was seeing this very interesting set of results mm -hmm. over and over. Um, and, but we didn't really quite know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know, um, what all of the results meant. Feel like something exciting may <laughs> like, be happening. We think something interesting is happening here that nobody knows about, yeah. but, but we couldn't quite put our fingers on it. And it turned out that there was a, a postdoc in the lab who um, had recently joined, and she actually looked at my results and she said, you know what, um, these results are suggesting to me that you know, what you're seeing looks a lot like a postdoc in my, what my previous lab was doing, mm. but he, was, he figured it out through a totally different way. Mm. And so we, we called up her old lab and the postdoc um, and the principal investigator at that, at that lab, and we just shared our data. Mm -hmm. We said, you know, this is what, you know, this is what I'm seeing, and they said, this is what we're, what we're seeing. And we kind of came to the realization that we had both come to the same conclusion but through totally different steps, so through totally different experiments. And it was actually a great opportunity for us to kind of finish up the work we were doing, mm -hmm. write it up, and then we submitted the papers back to back to, to molecular cell. Mm. So it was actually an example of where community, the scientific community and collaboration actually was instrumental to me getting my first major publication mm -hmm. um, in my PhD and actually you know, helping accelerate um, my graduation and kind of moving on to my next step after after my PhD. Cool. Was was there ever a moment in that uh, as you were approaching that collaboration where you felt at all like territorial about it and like, but this is supposed to be my thing, or was it just immediately yeah. like, cool, someone else is doing this? You know, I don't think so. Actually, I think um, what was so exciting was that um, it was an external validation mm -hmm. of what I had found, but through a totally different mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually an opportunity for us to both publish in a prestigious journal, um, you know, both get that first authorship, which is so important, you know, when you're when you're in academia, especially for me, you know, trying to trying to graduate. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't really a territory issue at all because it was just this amazing opportunity to where we both got to succeed and we both were able to actually support our findings with the findings of the other person. Mm -hmm. So I assume that these are two different labs. So the labs are based in two, uh, was, I don't know if it's two slightly different areas of study or two very different areas, areas of study, but do you feel like having that different perspective um, on the same subject changed your broader view a bit? And so my lab um, that I was working in was really focused on kind of 
at the time anyway, proteases broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a class of enzymes that cleaves other, other proteins. And we were focused on developing novel tools and, and kind of thinking about the ways to apply these tools. The other lab was much more of a fundamental um, you know, biochemical lab focused on many different aspects of apoptosis in particular, mm -hmm. so not just um, not just caspases, but a lot of the other machinery that's used to um, basically initiate apoptosis and carry it out. And so I think it was actually great in that, you know, we were this lab that was focused on, you know, generating these tools and, and applying them. And the other lab was kind of working on some of these really fundamental questions of, of biology. And so it was a really good opportunity um, to kind of cross-pollinate, mm -hmm. really, um, and kind of make make a bigger um, whole from the sum of our parts, right? Mm -hmm. um, because what we were doing was really synergistic. Cool. So during that early phase of your career, was there anyone in particular that like helped set you on the path that you're on or just supported you in some way? Yeah, I think early on at Stanford, um, you know, I rotated through multiple labs, um, but really landed um, in my thesis lab and, and Matt Bojo's lab uh, because I was really excited about his focus, which was using these tools that we were developing to not only make discoveries about fundamental biology, but also look towards applications, um, both in drug discovery, drug development, and, diagno and diagnostics. And mm -hmm. so I think joining his lab was, it was instrumental for, for kind of setting me on the course that I, that I um, chose and, and went on. And I think that he was an incredibly supportive um, mentor and advisor, and he's still a great colleague, you know, all of these years later. <laughs> um, but I think that his belief in me mm -hmm. and his support and kind of my alternative career path, yeah. I think was, was, um, was, was super important for me. When <laughs> you uh, described your early years, mm -hmm. you alluded to the fact that you always sort of felt like you wanted to do something somewhat applied, like you wanted yeah. to uh, work on science that had a real impact. Um, so my first question is, did you therefore never really think about a career in pure academia? <laughs> this is a great question, and it's one I actually get quite a yeah. bit. So I think there was a very brief time yeah. um, in college, and I think um, maybe very early on uh, when I got to Stanford where I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe an academic track um, would be would be an interesting one to explore, mm -hmm. but I think there was always this kind of undercurrent of um, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, so nobody mm -hmm. in my family is a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, they were all you know basically people that start businesses and run businesses and sell those businesses. And I had this love of science, and I think once I got to Stanford, it's such a vibrant entrepreneurial community. Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, I can do both of these things mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and this is the perfect place to do that. Um, and so I think that any any thoughts of, you know, maybe the, the academic track is the right track, I think I very quickly was like, wait a minute, trust your gut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a way there's a way to bring both of these together. So you talked about that experience during your PhD where you had that yeah. like just from a different lab, new perspective, um, got validation, answers. Did that change how you, you thought about your career, how you thought about um, your approach to science and work generally? Yeah, yeah. So I think at the time, I think it was a great lesson in being open about your data, being willing to talk about it, um, not being threatened by other people coming up with the same findings mm -hmm. and realizing, hey, this is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, this should this should be the norm. People should be talking about their data, ideally, and thinking about how, how does this validate what I've already done? And if it's through another direction, I think that's even better. I think that it behooves all of us to, you know, really invest in scientific community and these connections and value having somebody else replicate your work. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, first by repeating what you've done, but maybe even doing it in a different way and coming to the same answer. And the more that that can happen in different labs with different mm -hmm. people, it's when you can really believe that your result is real mm -hmm. and not just a fluke yep. or um, something that happened in your assay one day. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I think that's going to accelerate drug development. How did you think about forming those connections beyond that your like immediate cohort in your program or uh, your department? So when I was at Stanford, I, I took advantage of a lot of the opportunities um, available to me to take classes at the business school. And there were several other you know students from PhD programs who were there. Um, there was a, a summer program. Um, now I think it's called the Ignite program, but at the time it was like the Summer Institute of Entrepreneurship. And that was a, a, a great opportunity to kind of see all of the folks from PhD programs who were kind of self-selecting mm -hmm. <laughs> into, um, you know, trying to gain business skills mm -hmm. um, as well as their scientific skills at the same time. So I think that's kind of where it started, you know, trying to this conscious effort to kind of build a, a, a broader community. Um, I think that continued when I went to I went to management consulting after after my PhD, and there were several PhDs um, at uh, the Boston Consulting Group where I went, and then continued to um, meet other scientists at, at some of our clients. Um, so you know, large pharmaceutical companies. Um, that was another opportunity to continue to meet people, and I'm still in contact with some of those some of those folks who were my clients, um, even though it was a long time ago. Now. Um, and then I think when it, it really kind of, you know, exploded, so to speak, was um, after um, the Boston Consulting Group, I um, started uh, at Versa Ventures, which was an early stage um, seed and series A venture capital firm. And that's when I really started to kind of build out um, my scientific network further because mm -hmm. we had a, a, a very strong focus on starting companies mm -hmm. um, and to start novel companies in kind of breakthrough areas, um, one of the sources of that substrate is academia. Mm -hmm. And you really have to, you know, read the literature, attend conferences, go to those universities and, and knock on people's door and say, hey, I read your paper. Like, I think what you're doing is really cool. Can we talk about it? Mm -hmm. um, and in kind of doing that over and over again and building up a network that way. To me, like those two worlds are like fairly different just in terms of like the <laughs> dynamics and the personalities. Yeah. Like what is it like to kind of like bounce between those networks and uh, attempt to unite them? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, the there's more and more, um, I guess, cross pollination between those areas um, than ever before. I think that there's a recognition at the level of um, large pharma and large biotech that a lot of the innovation that's kind of fueling their commercialization engines is coming from small biotech, and the and the um, and what's fueling small biotech is academia, mm -hmm. and so I think that those ties are becoming um, much much closer, and so I think that there's a lot more trust that's been built um, between the between the two groups. And you know, there's there's lots of um, uh, PIs now who started multiple companies, mm -hmm. and you know, when you do that at an institution, you know, other PIs see that and they're like, well, wait, you know, like a lot of the things that I'm developing in the lab, you know, maybe maybe I should go for it, you know, yeah. maybe I should go for it, maybe I should take that call, or maybe mm -hmm. I should answer that email when somebody from, you know industry yeah. <laughs> right reaches yeah. out and says they'd like to talk to you about yeah. what they're doing can you tell me about any the importance of social relationships throughout your career and any in particular that come to mind when you think about like strong social forces i think that there's been multiple points along the way where um there's been you know mentors or individuals especially um early on in in my tenure at versant um, there were several people who I feel like took me under their wing and really um, helped develop me as an as a investor and operator. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know I owe those people <laughs> yeah. um, because they they really helped me um, you know develop as an investor, an operator, somebody in the you know broader scientific community. Um, and I try to pay that forward with people that. Um, work with me. Mm -hmm. In terms of a you know, really strong relationship I can think of, um, you know, the first one that pops into my head was the, I think, amazing relationship I had with the CEO of my previous company, Steve James. Um, you know, we had a, an amazing uh, working relationship where 
I felt like he was an incredible mentor and partner. Um, I felt like we complemented each other really well. Um, and I felt like he was always invested in my success mm -hmm. every day of the week, but was not afraid to push back on me at any time. Yeah. And I wasn't afraid to push back on him. And I think that, um, you know, even though, you know, we just sold the company that we worked on together for, for many years, um, when I think about, you know, what am I going to do next? He's one of the first people I call. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of having those voices in your community and not necessarily like all just like pumping each other up all the time? I think that, you know, it's always good to have somebody when you, you know, you can walk into their office after a board meeting and say like, was I too aggressive or did I make my point clearly? Yeah. Um, and, and have them say, I think you did this well, but I think here you could improve. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's critical. I mean, if it comes from a place of caring, mm -hmm. um, then I think that that, that is always going to be beneficial. Can you tell me about some more recent collaborations? Yeah. So, um, at Pioneer, we actually did, um, multiple, I think really exciting collaborations, but one that, that comes to mind was actually, um, a, a collaboration that initiated through a conversation we were having with a group of clinicians at an academic institution um, who were very interested in uh, collaborating with us on the clinical side, being a clinical site. Um, but when we were on the phone with them, they said, hey, you know, we actually have one of our colleagues here who works in um, fibrotic diseases um, here. It was actually at Mount Sinai, um, is really interested in your target for liver diseases outside of oncology. Mm -hmm. And we had actually done some reading on our own and had come to the same conclusion already and mm -hmm. actually um, had started to think about filing um, intellectual property in that direction. And so this felt like complete serendipity, mm -hmm. <laughs> actually. Um, and, and we said, yes, absolutely, please introduce us. Um, we got on the phone um, with, the, with the group and you know, I think very quickly realized that it was going to make a lot of sense for us to um, basically do a material transfer, so give them some of the mm -hmm. antibody that we mm -hmm. had developed um, in the lab and actually have them test it in their um, in vivo model, mm -hmm. um, which is a fibrosis in vivo model. And that ended up being extremely fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, our, our antibody looked very good in, in the model. Um, and so it established, um, I think, a very early kind of tantalizing potential proof of concept for this antibody that we had originally intended um, to develop for oncology, but now for a totally different area, also an area of very high unmet need. Um, but our antibody was so safe um, that, that it could potentially be applied in this mm -hmm. totally um, orthogonal, orthogonal space. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You're not the first person to talk about like a very serendipitous moment yeah. at, where two groups came together and really like helped one another. Um, and I do, I guess, believe in serendipity, maybe not, but uh, I also feel like you have to set yourself up to be in a position to yeah. Yeah. make these connections, right? Yeah. And so what, I guess, what would be your advice to either people either on the business side or on the science side to sort of broaden their network and run into these lucky chance occurrences more readily? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think sometimes, on, especially on the business side, if, you know, as an, a company operator, sometimes your thermostat's kind of set to no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're kind of set to no on, no, we don't want to spend money on yeah. that. No, we don't want to share anything. We mm -hmm. want to kind of, you know, keep what we're working on a little bit more sequestered until we feel a little bit more ready mm -hmm. to share. Um, and so I, as a, a leader at Pioneer, wanted to make sure that my thermostat wasn't set to no yeah. all the time. It definitely was not set to yes yeah. all the time either, but I wanted to make sure I could toggle mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of make um, very informed decisions about, okay, this is, this is somebody that's working on something really exciting. The investment of these resources is worth it. Um, let's continue to have discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really just having an openness um, on the other side of the coin, um, once we started to publish and went to conferences and had posters and um, a lot of excitement was generated about our programs, we had more collaborations than we could really, um, you know, I think in a, in, in a quality fashion entertain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a huge resource burden to these, to these collaborations, not only on the kind of legal and administrative side, but also 
if you engage in these collaborations, you want to make sure you have um, scientific alignment and, mm -hmm. and resources to deploy, um, you know, against them. Um, and so, you know, we had a lot of discussions within Pioneer about, you know, who are the who are the people that we should be collaborating with, um, and is this the right thing to do? And I think that um, where we kind of always came back to was, where are we going to have the highest impact? Um, what's going to be the result of this collaboration? So was it going to bring us into a new therapeutic area? Was this going to allow us to accelerate our clinical program into new tumor types? Was this going to answer a key question about um, the mechanism of action of our drugs that we've been missing? You know, those were some of the things that we, we you know, prioritized. Um, and unfortunately, weren't able to, you know, do every collaboration that kind of came our way. But that that's that's kind of you know up to a management team to make sure that you deploy resources responsibly. Mm -hmm. You set all that up by saying on the business side, but it to me it seems like pretty much all of that would also apply to science, like yeah. scientists as well, right? There's only a limited number of collaborations they can do, a limited number of resources. Do you think there's any different in that? sector? I think there's a lot of overlap. I mean, I think there are times when uh, maybe the research team said, hey, this could be interesting. This would help us answer a, a question that we've been curious about. Mm -hmm. But then we would kind of come together as a group of both kind of the business side and the scientific side and look at the slate of collaborations and say, okay, where should we be deploying our resources? Where do you want to be deploying your time? What's going to get us the you know biggest bang for our buck and kind of making that decision collectively mm -hmm. um, and not just doing the nice to haves, but kind of more of the, the must haves. Mm -hmm. It sounds like in this most recent role, you kind of signed off on collaborations, like you're like a kind of collaborations lord. Um, <laughs> do, you feel, do you feel like you've become like good at spotting what's going to work and not work? So I would say that it was really a, a team effort at our executive yeah. team level yeah. um, where I was kind of lending a business voice, mm -hmm. but also with a scientific hat. Mm -hmm. um, but there were other voices around the table, our chief medical officer, our chief development officer, our CEO, you know, we were kind of getting together and talking about, um, you know, where we wanted to prioritize. Both for people in a lab context, and particularly if you uh, are running a company, you might want to share data you might want to yeah. collaborate with everyone but there might be a, a proprietary element to that right, right. like if that's yeah. your money or your thing that you're going to sell you don't want to just give it away so how do you think about that tension yeah so i think the, the way to think about it is that you know say you're a company you mm -hmm. know if you've developed a new invention um and you're confident you know based off of the literature even if it's conceptual you can file uh, IP on that and then come back later and back that up with data. Mm. And then you feel comfortable that you have protected this concept that is, you know, the property mm -hmm. of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can go out and you can be a little bit more comfortable potentially sharing that, that data or maybe your, your antibody or compound or, or assay, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, you know, you've done your, your fiduciary duty, so to speak, and have protected that, mm -hmm. that IP. I mean, I think that's on balance, you know, where a company is going to need to come out on that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very different story for academia, mm -hmm. um, where there's more of a mandate to, to, um, or incentive or just a, um, expectation that that data is going to be shared more freely. Um, you're going to go to conferences, maybe share unpublished data with people mm -hmm. you trust. Um, and that's going to happen a lot more. So I, th I think it's really, um, it's, it's a nuance, um, you know, for business versus, you know, or industry versus non-industry. Um, but I think that, that the balance is achieved through um, kind of protecting, you know, novel intellectual property, um, and then also just building trust or only sharing with with groups that you, that you feel like you can really um, trust. Mm -hmm. And how did, how is that trust built? <laughs> yeah, I think it's through relationships over yeah. time. Yeah, honestly, um, I think it's through you know building your network, um, backing that up with with your own reputation. Um, being able to say, hey, call this collaborator who I've collaborated with and, and they can tell you what it's like to collaborate with me. You know, those yeah. types of things. Um, I think that's how it can be built. It sounds like you've had a pretty strong community and in a way that 
I think since you made so many kind of like leaps and didn't kind of go on a predefined path that I imagine was like pretty important that you had like, were there consistent people that made it feel like there was some consistency there? I mean, I think um, all along the way, there have been different people that have maybe popped up that have helped inform um, inform a, a next step. For example, it was one of my colleagues at uh, the Boston Consulting Group who told me about the job at Versant. Mm -hmm. um, so they had hired a recruiter to work on that role, but um, the recruiter actually hadn't reached out to me yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend said, hey, I heard you once in passing say that you were interested in this type of career. Like, let me connect you to the recruiter. Wow. Um, and that just happened at a happy hour that yeah. we both happened to be at. Mm -hmm. um, and that changed the course of my life. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy when yeah. you think about yeah. it. Um, that things can happen like that. Yeah. Always go to your happy hour, folks. <laughs> yeah, if you take nothing else away from this podcast, <laughs> yeah. it's make sure you go to happy hour. <laughs> You've talked about a lot of successful collaborations and ways in which you've uh, expanded your community, arrived at like yeah. new plateaus in your career. What about the failed collaborations? Like, have there been any doozies? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can think of several instances where, you know, the collaboration might not have succeeded in the way that we wanted because the scope that we laid out at the beginning was way too ambitious mm -hmm. or the experiment we designed just wasn't the right experiment mm -hmm. and it didn't get us the answer that we wanted. Um, and so I think for every successful collaboration, you know, there's going to be one or two maybe of those mm -hmm. kind of... Um, collaborations that didn't go the way that you wanted, but that's science. <laughs> <laughs> that's science, folks. Science. <laughs> yeah. You are at kind of like a new junction in yeah. your career, yes. it seems. Um, yeah. Can you tell me about what you're thinking about for the next stage and what kind of, what, what you're valuing at this point in your career? You know, I think um, I'm really focused on who I'm going to work with mm -hmm. at this next stage in addition to what am I going to do? Um, I would love to go back to starting new companies. Um, I love investing. I love kind of bringing those two things together. Um, so a role where I can do that is really ideal. Um, and I think to me, it kind of boils down to, I don't want to do something incremental. Mm -hmm. I want to do something that is a step change. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to put myself in a position where maybe it's serendipity yeah. um, plus a lot of hard work yeah, exactly. <laughs> where I can do that. So as you think about this uh, next step in your career, how do you think you're going to lean on and leverage your community? So I, I think, you know, for this next step in, in my career, I think um, I'm really excited about um, being able to expand beyond immuno oncology, which is kind of where I've spent the last several years mm -hmm. and, um, you know, be able to go back to colleagues I haven't spoken to for I years. Say go back to college. I was like, again? Go back to college. <laughs> <laughs> um, go back to previous collaborators or colleagues that I haven't spoken to in years and, uh -huh. and catch up with them. Um, but I think it's, it's something that I'll continue to um, invest in heavily. Yeah. What is something that brings you joy? One thing I've really gotten into in the last couple of years is science fiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I have just um, become um, a total bookworm when it comes to science fiction. I might read a book um, a week sometimes, wow. or maybe I'll read one in you know a course of a you know a flight or half mm -hmm. a flight or something like that. Um, and the reason I think I, I find it, um, both relaxing because it's kind of an escape, but I think it's it's allows you to kind of open up your mind and mm -hmm. think about things in a totally different way. Um, and I've actually found that it's really helpful um, when I go back to work and think about, okay, well, is this the only way to, to, to approach this problem? Um, because you've just been reading about, you know, something in the future where all these different things were possible or, mm -hmm. um, you know, some hero who handled a, a leadership um, crisis in a certain way that maybe you can apply to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that I know that might sound dorky, but I, I would have to say science fiction. Yeah, no, it's definitely <laughs> dorky. Uh, 
another, I think this is probably pretty dorky um, thing, but I have really come to appreciate it and value it is I love going to conferences. <laughs> it's like scientific mm-hmm. conferences mm-hmm. and just reconnecting with mm-hmm. people. So whether I'm standing at a poster and somebody I hadn't even thought of in a year comes up and we reconnect or the people I know are going to be at all the conferences I go to and I can't wait to see them at the next conference. Um, That surprisingly brings me like so much Mm -hmm. joy. And I think part of that really started during COVID when Mm -hmm. we just didn't have these conferences anymore and they were all happening virtually. And I think we really lost something. Um, without, you know, being able to have that face-to-face connection. Um, and so I guess that would bring me to another thing, which is I'm one of those people that loves to go into the office. I know this mm-hmm. is very not trendy, mm-hmm. um, but I love going to the office and I'm just, I like being around people. Mm-hmm. Um, so being around people, having that personal interaction um, really gives me energy. You know, one of the great things about conferences is Mm. getting face-to-face time Um, and I think it's not only a great opportunity to generate new collaborations Uh, we were recently at ASCO for example in June and after that meeting we got requests from many investigators to either collaborate with them at the clinical level or or at the preclinical level and I think you know that type of organic generation of collaborations Mm. is really important I also think it's an opportunity to form new relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Ikenna team um, that we worked with so closely in the M&A process um, all throughout July, we met face-to-face at ASCO this mm-hmm. year. And I think that that was incredibly important for us to kind of begin to build that working relationship that mm-hmm. allowed us to complete that transaction so quickly. If you were talking to a younger scientist or someone in training, um, what would you say are the benefits of collaboration? I mean, I think there's there's so many, um, but I think I would I would probably say to them that you know collaboration is a way to strengthen your findings. Mm. So you might have um, gotten a certain result, um, and, and maybe your unsure what that result means. But if you share it with somebody else who might be working in the same space, they might be able to add, you know, give you ideas, but maybe they're also seeing something similar Mm -hmm. and you are kind of getting to the same place, but through different paths. And that can add weight and heft to what, um, what you found and what they've found. So it sounds like throughout the course of your career, because you've always had your eye on not just being in the lab and running the exper- experiments, but also thinking about how does this apply and this and this eye towards, you know, I'm, I have the science background, but I'm going to be in the business world, I'm going to do this thing and that. So you've kind of like uh, had to, by necessity, be perpetually expanding your network, mm-hmm. building your communities, meeting more people. And, you know, you've experienced a lot of success and career growth as a result. So I, I'm kind of just wondering, uh, do you have any closing thoughts about the role of community in science? I think, you know, my thoughts would be it's worth investing in. So I think sometimes people underestimate the value of a relationship and they maybe overestimate the value of a given result or mm-hmm. experiment or piece mm-hmm. of data. Um, and I think that the relationship or investing in those relationships it's it's like investing in anything Mm -hmm. you know it grows over time Mm -hmm. if you continue to allow it to invest Mm -hmm. um, or allow it to grow and i think one other point i would make is not only are these relationships you know fundamental to growing your career um, maybe providing opportunities you wouldn't have normally had they can also just be a a source of joy in your Mm -hmm. life Um, and they certainly have been for me Well, thank you so much for being here, Alicia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thanks for listening to Kaleidoscope. Science happens because of community, and progress happens together. To learn more about how you can progress with ABCAM, visit abcam.com.